Our gospel reading this morning is from Luke chapter 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. <clears throat> they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. I pray God will bless us with the understanding of this word this morning. In a moment, I'm going to read another scripture passage, which we're going to be reflecting on. But in the reading that we heard from Brenda earlier, thank you, Brenda, for reading, um, we heard the story of that Easter morning on that first day of the week when some of Jesus' followers went to the tomb where he had been buried and they found that the tomb was empty. They found that the stone was rolled away and they found that Jesus was not there. And we were read twice that they were wondering about this. In verse 4, we read that they were wondering about this and then the two men in clothes came and told them, the news about Jesus. But at the end of that passage, we were left with that closest follower of Jesus, Peter, the one who had just a couple days before thought he could follow his master to the very end, but ended up betraying or denying him in that last night of Jesus' life on earth before he died. And we see Jesus confronted with this empty tomb, and it says, Peter got up and ran to the tomb bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. And it's that wondering that, ha that went along that I want us to, to join in with this morning. There is a lot of mystery to unpack when we're confronted with that empty tomb. And the passage that we're going to read unpacks some of it, and it's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. The joy and the laughter and the celebration will come after in the Easter story, but at first there is this wondering, and I hope we can bring the two together, that we can wonder about what this means and see how joyful that news is. So will you listen as we read together, or I read for you and you follow along, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but are under grace. Let's pray. Lord, as we prepare to consider these words and to wonder about the meaning of that resurrection morning, we pray that you will be with us. We pray that you, by your spirit, will speak to us the truth about Jesus, and through that would speak the truth about our lives. Because we all come carrying different burdens. They may be the burdens of just this morning and things that have happened before we came here. They may be burdens that have been weighing on us for a long time. We may be facing fears and uncertainty about the future. And here we are together today, listening to the account of our Savior who died for us and who death could not hold. This changes our world. It changes our lives. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us the truth that you have to say in us and to us and then through us as we seek to be your people who faithfully point to Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Speak during this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is a day of joy. And the sun came out to make sure that we knew it was going to be meant to be a day of joy. This day, Easter Day, Resurrection Sunday, is the high point of the year when it comes to the meaning of our Christian faith. This is the day when everything else comes together. The hope of Advent, the proclamation of peace that came when Jesus entered into the world at Christmas, they point here where peace ultimately was achieved in Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. The servant love of Maundy Thursday, as Jesus washed his friends' feet and shared his last supper with them, and then the full expression of that love in the sacrificial death, the redemptive death that he died on Good Friday. They all mean what they mean because on Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection was God's affirmation. It was God's all caps yes over everything that Jesus had done in his coming and his life and his death. Today is a day of joy. And it's a day of joy mainly because of what the resurrection promises us. So in the time that we have today, we're going to reflect on resurrection's promises. Sometimes promises do bring us joy. For kids, the promise of a March break vacation that's going to be spent at Disney World brings a lot of joy. Sometimes that joy comes when people are in middle of their life and they get told they're going to go to Disney World for a vacation. I'm looking at you, Julie. The days and the weeks and the counting down on Facebook and the anticipation starts to take on that feeling of the joy that's going to be experienced there even before the trip arrives. And sometimes even smaller promises can bring us joy. The promise of a warm house and a cozy bed at the end of a long and difficult day or maybe even the promise of freshly baked cookies after school. These things can bring joy to us. But not every promise brings joy. This world that we live in often promises us more than it can deliver. Products are advertised as if they will change our lives. Buy this car or this piece of clothing and you will be a different kind of person. You will be fulfilled. These promises are empty. But the promises of the resurrection, the promises that are made in Jesus being raised from the dead, these promises answer our deepest needs and our deepest longings. 
And in this passage in Romans chapter 6, there are two promises that we're going to look at this morning. The first promise of the resurrection is that we are able to live a new kind of life now. A life that is free from sin and that is powered by God. And that promise is found first in verses 2 to 4. And if I set a little bit of context for this chapter, which we jump in in the middle of an argument, in the middle of a discussion, Paul has been talking, the writer of this letter, in chapter 5, about the free gift of God that has brought life to us sinners. And he's been telling us about what a completely undeserved gift, a completely undeserved pardon for sin, a completely undeserved new relationship with God that has come through Jesus Christ's life and death. His point through chapters 1 to 5, really, and especially in chapter 3 and beyond there, is that we are all unable to do for ourselves what it is that Jesus has done. And it comes as this totally free gift. And so then he asks, as many people have done, if nothing that I do brings me into a good standing with God, does that mean I can just do whatever I want with my life? Does it mean I can just go on not caring about the decisions that I make, whether it's right or wrong, because God is so good and gracious that he just wants everybody, and he won't care if I'm doing that? And so that's the question that's on Paul's mind. And then at verse 2, he says, By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? He says here that the whole idea of being a Christian is that our lives are fully shared with Jesus. So that to come to Jesus, which is symbolized in our baptism when we profess our faith, as we go down into that water, a symbol of us dying and being buried with Jesus, that to come to Jesus is to have died to him, to have been buried with him. And that leads us to this promise our death with Christ means that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So this question of, can I do whatever I want? Does it matter what I do with my life? Is a silly question, Paul says, because you actually have been changed. You're a new person. That question doesn't really fit. It doesn't follow. Resurrection promises that we don't live in sin any longer. Our life has been changed. Now, in daily life, we don't talk much about sin anymore. Even in the lives of Christians, very few seem to see their daily life as the kind of battle against sin that is talked about in this passage. But honesty will lead most of us to recognize that we are aware of a problem. In an old definition, somebody said that sin is when humans are turned in on themselves or curved in on themselves, away from God, away from other people, the two that we are called in this life to love and to serve. And I wonder if we've ever been turned in on ourselves, focused on our own happiness and our own satisfaction and our own needs, as much as we are right now. A moment's reflection shows us that the problem is real. And then there are those times that each of us experience differently when we are aware of what the Bible calls sin in our lives, even if we don't use that word. We often find ourselves trapped in patterns that eat up our time and energy in unhealthy ways. And we find ourselves stuck in habits and behaviors that we just wish that we could change and we don't seem able to. The good news is this. For those who come to Christ, the resurrection is a promise that we can have a new life now, powered by God's Spirit and sharing our deepest selves with God. Verse 6 says, Our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And the point here is not that our bodies are going to be done away with, but rather the body ruled by sin, that our actions that are all done through these bodies, if you can tell me anything you've done right or wrong that wasn't done with your body, your mouth, your words, your hands, your feet, 
but we've come into this spot in our lives where our bodies are ruled by a wrong pattern. And he says that's going to be done away with. We don't need to be ruled by sin anymore. In Christ, we are new people, and we can live in a new way. Sometimes the point of this passage has been expressed with a short sentence that will be easy to remember, and that is, become what you are. Become what you are. Sin doesn't have power over us anymore. We are new people, and now we find our life's new meaning and direction in God. That's why in verse 11, it tells us, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. And when it says, consider yourself this way, it's not a saying make believe or pretend that you are this. It's about becoming in our daily lives, our actions and our habits, what we truly are because of Jesus. We need to start behaving in line with our new reality. N.T. Wright says that it's something like when a person moves from one country to another and finds that it's no longer appropriate to keep on speaking the same language they were speaking in the other country. Instead, they have to come to learn the language of the new country. And our new country is the country of the resurrection. So we stop speaking the language of death. We stop acting according to the old ways of sin and death. They don't fit with who God has made us to be in Christ. A lot of misery has come into people's lives who have professed faith in Christ and have experienced some of that transformation with him, but then try to go on just living the way they used to, and they feel torn up inside because of it. It's because that's not who they truly are. No wonder they're struggling within themselves. Maybe that's some of us this morning. No, this passage tells us that we are alive to God. We are meant to be lively with him, talk to God, give our needs over to him. We're to ask him to make us wise and to strengthen us for our work. And then we do what it says. We actively turn away from those wrong ways and we offer ourselves to God's service. And we offer ourselves to God's service, not grudgingly, but happily because it's a gift to be able to be in life with God. Practically, this begins with something as simple that each of us can do as taking time to pray in the morning and throughout the day for God to point us in a new direction, to remind us of who Jesus is and of who we are in him when temptations to sin come along. It's taking time to pray in the morning and throughout the day for God to give us a desire to know him and to open his truths up to us through reading the scripture. It's taking time to pray in the morning and throughout the day for the efforts that we're going to make to serve him, that God would be the power at work in us. This promise of a new life is what we sang about earlier in that song, Death Was Arrested. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore on the cross. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began. That's the first promise, this promise of a new life. And it's one that can actually be a reality for us now. It doesn't have to remain a promise that we're looking for. If we have come to Christ, this promise can be made into a reality as we respond to God. And for those who might be here this morning and have not yet come to know God through Jesus in this way, we can hear it as an invitation. Those old cycles that many of us know of meaninglessness or the sense of meaninglessness in life, of hurts given and received, of shame carried through our lives, these can all lose their power as we turn to Jesus because in his death and resurrection, their strength has been sapped. So joy comes because of this first promise of the resurrection. The second promise of the resurrection is the promise of eternal life in God's new creation. Now this promise looks to the future. We've received this promise we receive it this morning as we hear and listen to the story of the resurrection, but we're waiting for its fulfillment. 
And we find this promise in verses 5 and 8. Verse 5 says, If we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. And verse 8 tells us, If we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. The resurrection of Jesus tells us that there is an answer to death. It tells us that for those who belong to Jesus, death is not the final verdict on our lives. It is not the end. And we shouldn't make light of this promise. Sometimes we hear people scoff at the faith of those who want to be sure that they're going to go to heaven when they die, as if that's a selfish thing to hope for. True faith, we're told, focuses on the life that we have now, the service and the work that we can do to make our lives better and more profitable now for God. But the biblical teaching always is both. The service and work that we do for God now, but also this promise of a life with God forever. It's true that some people talk about Jesus as if he's an escape hatch from a troubled life. And we should try to correct that thinking in people who are thinking that way. And maybe it's us sometimes, just waiting to get away. But to think about what happens when we die is a perfectly right thing for us to do. In fact, it's one of the most important questions that we can ask. If bodily life is not the end of the story, which Jesus' resurrection tells us it is not, then it matters very much that we prepare for our death. Asking questions about death is not only important, it's something that is commonly done. In Hebrews 2, we're told that the fear of death is a universal experience. And if we, in our day in 2024, don't talk about death very much, it's more likely because we're in denial of it than that we're wiser or more mature than people of old days. Questions about death still cause concern and fear today. Stephen Colbert sometimes asks his guests on The Late Show a series of questions that he calls the Colbert Questionnaire. And one of the questions is, what happens when we die? And when he asks that question of these Hollywood celebrities that he's interviewing, I've noticed a few basic types of answers. And these answers point to the ways that I think most people think about death. Some people respond to this question, what happens when we die, with real and visible anxiety on their faces. They give an answer and then they look at Colbert as if they might be worried that they've said the wrong thing or they've missed something. There are others who respond with vague hopes, saying things like, I hope it's something good. Or, we see the people we love, often that question mark is on people's voices. And then there are others whose responses are denials of death. Like when Arnold Schwarzenegger claimed that all of his working out and his pumping iron through his life was so that if death ever came to him, he would terminate him. The answer got a laugh, but it also shows how much of a shadow death casts over our lives. In Jesus' resurrection, victory over death was achieved. Jesus is the first case of somebody that death was unable to undo. Death made its efforts. It took him down at the cross, but it could not keep its hold. The promise of Jesus' resurrection is the promise of the final overcoming of death's grip over everything. The resurrection of Jesus is compared in Scripture to the first fruits of a crop that is about to come. Christ is raised as the first fruits of what will one day happen, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. And at the day of Jesus' return, our bodily resurrection will follow in turn after his. So Jesus' resurrection is a promise that has an analogy in something that we experience at the end of winter and the beginning of spring each year. We start noticing the lengthening of the days in February, and we begin even then to hope, some of us who aren't crazy people who love dark, long winter days, we begin to feel hope about what's coming. Winter is ending. 
Now, we might see a few more snowstorms in the weeks after that, but we know for certain that spring is coming. C.S. Lewis, in an essay called The Grand Miracle, put it beautifully. He wrote, the miracles that have already happened are, of course, as Scripture so often says, the first fruits of that cosmic summer which is presently coming in. Christ has risen, and so we shall rise. To be sure, it feels wintry enough still, but often in the very early spring, it feels like that. 2,000 years are only a day or two by God's scale. A man really ought to say the resurrection happened 2,000 years ago in the same spirit in which he says, I saw a crocus yesterday. Jesus' resurrection is the sign of that coming cosmic summer as Lewis named that beautiful new world. And if Jesus' resurrection is that first sure sign, what is it a sign of? We've already seen that it's the sign of our own, the followers of Jesus, our own resurrection into new, renewed bodies. But that's not all it is. Jesus' resurrection is the sign of the healing and restoration of the entire created order. As it says in Romans 8.21, the creation itself, which is groaning at the present time, a groaning that we know well from the things that go on in our world, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and will be brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. The world, in a sense, will be resurrected as we will. This, again, is resurrection's second promise that we will experience beyond our own death an everlasting resurrection life with God in his new creation. So this is a day of joy because it comes with these two joyous promises. A shorthand way of talking about these two promises is that our Easter faith tells us about resurrection in the body and resurrection of the body, always going back and forth between the two. So resurrection in the body is the life that is available to us now. This life that's no longer ruled by sin, in which we are alive to God, and that we live wholeheartedly in his presence every day, asking his strength and his wisdom to walk with us. And resurrection of the body is the life that we will, are still waiting for. When our bodies will be transformed, when death will finally and forever lose its power, and when we will live face to face with God, no longer fearing death or troubled by death's presence. Resurrection in the body calls us to speak the language of the country that we've moved to, to become in our everyday life what we truly are in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Resurrection in the body calls us to dedicate ourselves to knowing God more deeply, to searching out the scriptures, to know him and his story and his character better, because we are made to be alive to him. And resurrection of the body calls us to live in the present as people of hope, to live even with the suffering that comes our way, knowing that God will have the final say. In God's new creation, there is no wrong that won't be righted, nothing broken that won't be healed, no pain that won't be eased, no tear that won't be wiped away. This is important to remember because the truth is that this life isn't always easy. Some of you might say that life is almost never easy. We experience the brokenness of sin and death in dozens of different days in the course of ev dozens of different ways in the course of every single day. It comes out in our bodies, in our relationships, in our disappointments, in our griefs, in our betrayals. But we remember that that's what Jesus' life was like as well. He experienced the brokenness of the body. We see him getting tired. We see his body giving up to death. He experienced it in relationships and betrayals as people that were close to him turned away, denying that they knew him or turning him over to be given to the authorities. Jesus 
experienced disappointment as he looked at the city of Jerusalem and wept that they were not receiving the good news that God had prepared for them. Jesus experienced grief as he wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. And we learn from Jesus that these challenges don't mean that we are doomed to fail in our faith or falter in our hope. As it says in Romans 8, verse 10, just a page over from this, if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. This world is hard because it's a world that sin has marred. That's what that phrase, your body is subject to death because of sin, means. But it's a world that has been injected with the life of God because of his work in Jesus Christ. Here again, that first promise of a new life now is affirmed. And then in that, the next verse in chapter 8, in verse 11, he goes on to reaffirm the second promise we've been considering. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Today we celebrate Easter and we open our ears to hear the promises that God speaks to us through the resurrection of Jesus. And we pray that God will call us by these promises to live an enriched life with him now and to fill us with hope for all his plans for our future joy. Let's pray. Lord, we have heard these promises of resurrection in the body, the new life we can have now, and resurrection of the body, the promise of our renewed bodily resurrected lives in your new creation. Help us, Lord, to respond as people who are alive to you and dead to sin in this life we have now and to live with hope in the face of difficulty for the promises you have made about the future. Strengthen each of us for these tasks, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.